Hello, everyone. Before we begin this week's episode, uh, just a special dedication to someone who was a really important person on the battlefields. That's Jackie Plateau from the Last Post Association at the Menin Gate. And sadly, he died last week after a lifetime of service to to that memorial and to the people recorded on it. So anyone who's been to the last post service at the Menin Gate, one of the most important services on the Western Front, would have seen Jackie. He was always busy. He was always at the front. He often read the ode and he was always busy organising wreaths for school children and, and, and basically ran the whole show there. And he really did a lot of great work in in conserving that that service and making sure that that service continued even during covid and so he was he was a good mate and, and someone that uh, that most Australians got to know when they went to that service at the Menin Gate and, and a sad loss to the town of Ypres. So this episode of the podcast is, is dedicated to Jackie and, uh, and his wonderful work at the Menin Gate. A Living History Production I'm Matt McLaughlin. And I'm Pete Smith. We're battlefield historians who love nothing better than getting out and walking the ground where great battles in history took place. And now we'd like you to come with us. Every week, Battle Walks will take you to one of the great battlefields of Europe. As we walk the ground, we'll dig through the pages of history, we'll uncover the secrets of the battlefields, and most importantly, we'll tell the stories of the people who fought and died there. Welcome to Battle Walks. Hello and thank you for joining us for another episode of Battle Walks as we walk across the great battlefields of Europe. I hope you're enjoying listening to what we're doing because we are certainly enjoying doing it. It's been a wonderful journey over the past several months. We've now had tens of thousands of downloads. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. It's just been gratifying and fantastic to share in this experience with you. When we started doing this, we had no idea how people would respond. And it's just been great that everyone's on board and enjoying what we're doing. And part of the reason is no doubt my co-host who does a wonderful job every week. It's Pete Smith. Pete, welcome back. Hey, Matt. Good to be with you again. Looking forward to this one, mate. Back to Belgium, which I know is a popular spot for you and I. It's a popular spot for visitors. We take on tours and there's no more important site. Along with the Menin Gate at Ypres, there's no more important site than the one we're doing today. It's Tynecott Cemetery. Now, this is the destination that everyone visits. It, it, I, I don't have statistics on this, but it must be the most visited site on the Western Front, I would imagine. I mean, even even coaches that are not doing a battlefield tour that are just on their way through the area tend to stop at Tynecott. It is huge. It's the world's largest Commonwealth military cemetery. It's huge. It's on a vitally important part of the Passchendaele battlefield, one of the most famous battlefields of the First War. Just an amazing site all around. What's, what's, what's your relationship like with Tynecott Cemetery, Pete? That's a very good question because it's mixed Um, in the sense that I like it when there's very few people there. But because of the reason it is so popular, it it can get unbelievably unbelievably busy. And in that period uh, of the centenaries, then you'd sometimes drive up and there'd be 20 or 30 coaches there. And you're thinking, oh, my Lord, that is just so many people. And it did occasionally feel like you were you were with a football crowd. Now it's great that so many people want to go and, uh, and visit the, the men that fought and died in the Great War. But it, it's just an awful lot of people to cram into. It is a big cemetery, but an awful lot of people to be in there. So I prefer to go early in the morning or late in the evening as the sun's rising or falling. And, uh, uh, and it's just spectacular when you're there with just a very small group, or even if you've managed to get there by yourself, uh, th- then you really get a, a good feel of, of the whole site and the feel of how many graves there are. If you can't see them because there are so many people in there, then it makes it just slightly difficult. But it's a, it's a stunning place to, to stand there. Horrific, yes, I suppose, because these are soldiers that fought and died in the Great War. But it is a, it's such a, a magnificent memorial, you'd have to say, to them. It's fascinating the number of people that are now going to these sites. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. For years and years, there was a time when people weren't bothering to turn up at all. You hear people talk about in the 1960s going to the last post service at Menin Gate and being the only person standing there, that the the number of of, uh, buglers outnumbered the number of people in the crowd. So obviously those days are far behind us. Hopefully it's sustainable. Hopefully people will continue to do it. And hopefully they'll do it for the right reasons. I, I, I don't get the impression that people are just ticking off you know, an item on a list of sites to stop at. There does seem to be genuine interest and genuine connection from from the thousands and thousands of people that go there every year. 
Yeah, I think I have to disagree slightly. I think slightly Tynecott is for some people a, a tick on the box, and certainly for the cruise liners that are, are coming into uh, Belgium, where they just get a choice of visits. Then sometimes you, you know, I've I've heard people literally walk through the the gate there and go, "Wow, that's fantastic." And you're, you're looking and think, that's kind of an odd thing to say, really. But I know why they're saying it. It's because they're being taken to these, wow, fantastic sites uh, uh, for the whole of the, the, the cruises that they're on. And so they just automatically say it. But it does. it is a strange reaction as you walk into a cemetery and go, wow, look at that. Well, why don't we start? Why don't you give us a bit of a description of the, of the cemetery? Because this is like no other cemetery in the world. Why don't we talk about, let's, let's have an overview of just what it is, why it's there, you know, the, the, the reasons that Tynecott exists in the form that it does. Well, I think what we'll, we'll, we'll start with is the name itself, uh, Tynecott. Now, over the years, I've heard lots of variations of why it's called Tynecott. And I think everybody or most people now fairly much agree that uh, the Tyne part of it is a river uh, in the north of England. And there was an, various areas up on these ridges were being uh, de- depicted by the map, the people that were, were drawing up the maps and saying, well, we'll call this area Tyne, we'll call this area another river, we'll call this the Seine, we'll, cause, we'll call this the Marne. Um, so that's where the name Tyne comes from, it's a river. And then Cot is an abbreviation of, uh, of cottage. Um, so it was Tyne Cottage, and, and it was a, probably a small grouping of farm buildings. It could even have been the German blockhouses that from afar looked like a small grouping of, uh, of buildings. So I think that's the, the reason it got the name Tyne Cot. There's a story that it was Northumberland Fusiliers who were in the area and they, they were the people that named it. But actually, we know that it was already named as Tyne Cot prior to even to them arriving. So I think it's just a, a name that was picked by the people that were drawing the maps. Uh, and so it's a, a battlefield name that then is going to be used since they're going to build a cemetery there. They're going to then call it uh, a Tyne Cot as well. So that's, that's how it's got its name. It's an interesting thing, the um, the naming of all these places from the First World War. I find it fascinating because some of the most famous sites on the Western Front have earned their names for no reason at all, except it was an arbitrary name on a map. And Tynecott's a perfect example of that. It doesn't actually mean anything today. It, it's been effectively lost in the mists of time why it was called that. But the point is the people that named it probably didn't care that much. The What you note when you look at these maps is there's so many features that need to be named. It does feel almost a little bit like fatigue in the, the system of naming them at some stage. We've got to call it something so soldiers know where to go when they receive orders. And they're just, you know, they're saying, okay, we're going to name them after streets of London. We're going to name them after, you know, locations in the southwest of England. We're going to name them after, you know, small towns in the outback of Australia, <laughs> whatever generic system they use. And one that I know to, as well in not very far from Tynecott is there, there used to be a very famous pillbox called the Anzac uh, pillbox, Anzac pillbox. And everyone was like, oh, that was named, must be because Australians or New Zealanders captured it and they wanted to honour their comrades and et cetera, et cetera. But you look on a map and you note that the pillbox next to it was called Helles and the pillbox next to that was called Suvla. So obviously the person who drew the map had served at Gallipoli and simply named the pillboxes after the sectors of Gallipoli that they recalled. So it's it's a fascinating aspect and hopefully someone will do some more work into it one day about the arbitrary naming of these now famous sites. I think they also used uh, th- those kind of uh, I- I- one that's close to me here is is drinks. It's uh, alcoholic drinks, and it's word association for men that are tired and are trying to figure out, you know, try- are trying to remember where these areas are that they're supposed to be uh, assaulting, or in fact even leaving from or heading to. Then do a bit of word association. It helps you remember what the what the names were. So I think that's also used. And often the um, the letter of the trench square that they're in as well. So trenches and, and features in the you know, the, tr- the the maps were divided up by alphabetic letters, and you know often often you'll find in a square that if it's an M for example in the M square they'll all be called Malt Trench, you know Maple Trench. They'll they'll have variations on M names so that you know if you hear a name of a trench or a feature, you know instantly which square it's going to be in. So again, a fascinating chapter. We probably get a, we could get way too bogged out <laughs> delving into it in this podcast, but I'd love some more research to be done on it at some stage. I thought you were going to drift on then to uh, to uh, how you uh, look at map references of the first. Oh yeah, World let's War. let's do map references. Let's do map references for another podcast. I think. I think I think we should do that on the podcast one day. We should suck in the dear listener <laughs> with a with a famous uh, a famous yeah. destination, then bog them down with how to read a trench map. That would be a you know a fascinating <laughs> exercise. But um, no, that's true. Tynecott is one of those great mysteries, and people argue about the name. Um, and, they, and I'm sure they will for you know, time immemorial. Um, talk about the let's talk about the size of this cemetery, Pete, because that's one of the key that is the key feature of this cemetery. 
It is. Um, so it is the biggest Commonwealth War Graves cemetery in the world. And before we go into the figures, you have to say, well, why is that? Why do we need this enormous cemetery? Well, it, it's as simple as this. So many of the burials were individual burials in this area uh, that there needed to be a big cemetery to to gather them all in. There there were very few actual small cemeteries built. There are there are going to be a number. They are also going to be closed down and brought into this this enormous cemetery. But it was felt that what they needed was a big concentration cemetery to bring in the dead that were that were being found in the clearances and also removed uh, from marked graves. You have to say, so many people are, are became missing in this area that almost anywhere you dug your, your spade as you're levelling the ground, as you're building your farms, then you, as horrific as it may sound, you are very likely to find the remains of the soldiers that fought there. So they needed to be somewhere where they could be brought, and that, that's why we get this, uh, this cemetery created. Now, interestingly, it's created around an original burial ground. So there is a small burial ground that was started during the fighting in 1917, uh, containing 343 graves, and the, those graves were tucked in just behind a, a pillbox, and that pillbox uh, was used as a, a medical aid post at that period. So these are soldiers that are either dying in the med medical aid post or being brought in just from the surrounding areas. Now, it was still very dangerous at that time. The Germans are just over the ridge. They're not that far away. Uh, and so even then, these 343 were brought in with difficulty. And sadly, we're going to lose that land because in 1918, during the German Spring Offensive, we will actually lose it. The 13th of April is when we lost the land again. And, it, and the Germans actually buried some of their own dead in the same area. Uh, and then eventually it's retaken by the Belgian army on the 28th of September. This 1918, this little cemetery is still there. And this is the becomes the core of an expansion that will take it to the extraordinary numbers that we have uh, now. So it's nearly 12,000 uh, soldiers are buried here. The actual figure is 11,961. Now we have to keep an eye on that figure because this is still an open cemetery. They will still bury soldiers within uh, the complex here or the, the graves here. So 11,961 at present, I believe, um, of them. And this is the figure that always shocks everybody. So let's say 12,000 buried and eight and a half thousand of those, again, rounding it up slightly, are unknown. So we don't know who they are. So they have no name on the headstone. And that is just extraordinary, isn't it? 12,000 and eight and a half thousand unknown. We don't know who they are. And that gives you an indication of the horrific the horrific task faced by the people exhuming these bodies in trying to identify them as they brought them into this cemetery. And sadly, the greater number of them are not going to be identified. Pete, there's a few really important things I want to focus on there in that excellent description. Thank you for that. But firstly, I want to say that a couple of years ago, you and I did a podcast on my Living History channel uh, about cemeteries and how they were formed and the, the people that, that recovered the body. So it's it's a fascinating topic. And I know you and I are absolutely fascinated with the, the recovery of bodies, yeah. as gruesome as it is. It's yeah. a vital part of the story because the cemeteries we now see today are the results of that hard work done by people in the early 1920s. So firstly, go back, find Living History uh, on uh, your favourite podcast app and go and listen to that. Uh, it's, it's just called World War One Cemeteries with Pete Smith and uh, an excellent discussion from Pete about how these cemeteries were formed. But let's talk about the nature of the fighting in 1917. We are going to begin a tour of the cemetery very soon, but let, let's just talk about the nature of the fighting in 1917 because it was quite specific. There were, there's quite specific reasons that in this part of Belgium there are these huge concentration cemeteries as opposed to the smaller battlefield cemeteries you would see in somewhere like the Somme or the Arras sector. Let's talk about the nature of the fighting here in 1917 and why it directly leads to these huge cemeteries with huge numbers of unknowns. Well, the simple nature, the landscape itself is horrific. Uh, it's because it's low-lying uh, land in the main. Obviously, this is actually built on the slope of a ridge. A little bit more about that later, but it's on the slope of a ridge. Um, but it's low-lying land. It's heavy clay. It gets waterlogged. It's horrendous. And it had been drained over, over centuries. It had been drained by a, a network of clay pipes just below the surface, which kept the water down. That's all gone, smashed to pieces by the bombardments. And so this has really turned into a quagmire. Also, most of the area, until we clear these ridges in 1917, we are overlooked by the Germans. And that means, obviously, you're, you're not going to lose the living to bury the dead. And so the burial of and creation of cemeteries was exceedingly difficult. And it meant that the majority of men that were killed in this morass 
where I just rolled into the nearest shell hole, covered over as, as best they could, rifle with a helmet on top. If you're lucky, somebody will later on will come along with a more substantial cross and try and mark, mark your grave. But the big issue is, this is con- constantly being turned over. This is being shelled all the time. There is a, a toing and froing. And it means that the bodies were lost over and over again, and, and sometimes horrifically reinterred and then buried again. And yeah, it's just it just it was just a nightmare landscape. And of course, the period that we're talking about here, it's now known as the Battle of Passchendaele. The overall uh, campaign is Third Eep. Passchendaele's the last phase of it, and this is just prior to that last phase. This is the fourth of October. We're going to be discussing in nineteen seventeen. The weather is just about to get worse. The weather is just about to change and it's going to start raining incessantly, which just, you can imagine what it's going to be like. It's just purely horrific. There's no shelter. You've got your waterproof cape. If you can get under that, that's the best you can hope for. So the recovery, burial, uh, or the burial of bodies, the movement of bodies during the, the campaign is almost impossible. And it really will be till the end of the war because the Germans are going to be eventually just forced over the ridge. They're not that far away. We get a limited clearance. Then the Germans come back and recapture the landscape. They're not interested in clearing it. So we really have to wait until the end of the war before, before we can get to grips with, with the proper burial of the men that fought and died on these ridges. The way you describe that, Pete, it's just ghastly. The idea of people rolling shattered bodies into shell holes and covering them with the nearest mud that they could lay their hands on and just marking it with a rifle and bayonet, those graves are going to be lost within a matter of days, let alone years. I mean, the, the bloke that you buried last week it has no chance that he is still there or his grave can be found or he can be identified you know, a few days later, let alone years after the war, let alone years later. So that, that's why we just see such a huge number of unknowns. And there's a big there's a big problem going on here as well, compounded sadly by the new identity disc that had been issued um, in nineteen. Uh, I think it starts to be issued in nineteen sixteen, and and these uh, could even be possibly late nineteen fifteen. Not quite so sure on that, but the, the new two part identity disc, which they go oh, that's good. One part will go with the burials office, and the other one will remain on your on your remains. It's a fibrous material, actually designed not to to burn. Uh, so it's actually a, a compound material, including asbestos, oddly, and uh, and that that doesn't like being in the ground in the waterlogged uh, conditions for a long time, and it swells and it will eventually d- disintegrate. So the issue you have is if a body is going to be in the ground for over a year before it can be recovered, then the likelihood of finding those uh, identity uh, that or that identity still on the on the remains is 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 unlikely the other thing you have to remember is that you know these human remains are only a year old and not just bones these would be horrifically flesh as well and are you going to start trying to find the identity disks? Well, soldiers actually even tried to, to help with that process. They knew that the cord could rot through, it could get damaged. So th- they would actually place their identity disk in their top left-hand pocket rather than keep it on a, a string around their neck. It meant that, th- that everybody knew where it would be. Well, sadly, even that's not going to work particularly well because the uniform will be rotting. The, uh, the, horrifically, the, the disk could even drop through into the body cavity. And people just don't want to fish about that that much trying to find so I've actually seen soldiers in my photo collection I have of the Great War uh, of, of portraits, portraits of soldiers. I've actually got a couple of photos where the soldiers have gone one better. They've actually stitched the identity disc onto the outside of the pocket. So it's already stitched there. And I think that in its own right is horrific. Now, these guys are preempting their own deaths and preparing for their own deaths by fastening their, their identity discs onto, the, onto their uniforms. Um, but anyway, that was one of the things they tried, but still to no avail because after over a year, these these discs start to uh, uh, just start to fall to pieces. You won't you won't easily find them. Uh, it's a great shame if they kept the metal ones, which they had prior to uh, in the say the Gallipoli campaign. They had uh, metal identity discs. They were made out of aluminium. But the issue with aluminium identity discs is that they melt, and, and because they had fires uh, across some of the areas on the uh, on the peninsula, and the bodies actually caught fire and the discs melted, so they went to this. Uh, asbestos based uh, disc which um, yeah it was a great idea but sadly didn't work for being buried in the ground what a feature of the war that we don't discuss very often but the the, the confrontation of your own death the nature of the soldiers the, and the, their their own mortality and soldiers doing things like um, constructing their own identity discs out of metal which they'd often wear around their wrist you see photos sometimes of soldiers with a metal plate around their wrist with their details on it just imagine what that does to a human noting that 
you know, just not wanting to disappear into the ground forever, wanting to, even, even during the war. I mean, we know now about the huge numbers of missing, but obviously it was a factor during the war and soldiers they knew it. going yeah. out of their way to try and avoid that fate for themselves. Yep. I mean, what a, you know, what, yeah. a, what, a, what a way to live your life. Just, just absolutely horrific. What, what we should say about Tynecott, Pete, is it's not just a cemetery. It's also a battlefield in its own right. So let's talk about the fighting in October 1917 in particular. Uh, and leading up to that, and 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 why the cemetery is where it is, and 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 the the nature of it as a battlefield. Yeah. So uh, of course, um, it's it's interesting when we look at the cemetery now. There is at first glance no obvious relics of the battlefield left there, but the, the biggest relic is where the cross of sacrifice. Every Commonwealth War Grave cemetery, as we know, has a cross of sacrifice, and beneath that cross of sacrifice, we actually have a, a very large blockhouse. Covered over by uh, the uh, Jurassic limestone now, apart from one small patch where we have a bronze wreath and we can then in the centre of the wreath we can actually see uh, part of the uh, of the blockhouse itself. But when you look more carefully uh, to the, the other end, and I have to say we have entered, so we've already, we've just walked into the cemetery and we are walking in from the back. It's now where the car parking is. Uh, you can walk right the way to the front, but actually I like coming in from the back because uh, you've got the wall behind you, which is going to carry the names of the missing, another aspect of this cemetery that we'll talk about. And um, But you get that immediate view across the whole the whole gambit of the cemetery, really, the graves, the, uh, the cross of sacrifice, the stone of remembrance, which every uh, large cemetery will have. And then right at the other end of the cemetery, we can see two prominent German blockhouses that have nothing on them. They are just there as part of the, the concept, the design of the cemetery. And so it, it, it tells you immediately that we are not just in a cemetery, we are, we are on the battlefield. And the way that we get an absolute uh, confirmation of that is if we walk to the front, to the other side of the, uh, the blockhouse, then we can see the words inscribed on it. This was the Tankot blockhouse captured by the 3rd Australian Division, 4th of October 1917. So it tells us straight away that we are actually standing on the blo- uh, on the middle of a battlefield. And I have to say, in in the years that I've been going there, you're looking among the graves, you're looking at the graves, I've looked down and I've actually picked up shrapnel balls, lead shrapnel balls within the, the, the confines, the walls of the cemetery. So it's an extraordinary fact that this is not just a cemetery, but also a battlefield and an important Australian battlefield. It's the Battle of Broodseend Ridge from October 1917. I mean, I, it's it's a spectacular story of how the Australians captured that area. The field in front of the cemetery across the road was the scene of of some of the most horrific attacks that the Australians made through that area, and gaps in the barbed wire and German machine guns pouring from this from this spot on top of the ridge. And there were dozens of blockhouses just like the two at the front of the cemetery on top of this ridge, and um, just incredible stories of bravery. The farm across the road from Tynecott as well as Hamburg Farm. Uh, and there's uh, there's another couple of blockhouses there which were captured by Lewis McGee from Tasmania. He captured those with a revolver in uh, during the Battle of Broodseed Ridge. It's just extraordinary acts of heroism on the ground where you are standing. It's an important central point in that fighting of, of Third Eep. I mean, everywhere in the Eep salient there was fighting, but to stand on this point, you are standing right in the middle of some of the toughest actions, which you know from both the Battle of Broodseed Ridge in early October, and then of course leading into the Battle of Passchendaele. So interestingly, uh, Sergeant Lewis McGee, who you just uh, mentioned, is buried here within the complex of the cemetery, which uh, thankfully he's got a grave, which which is uh, a good thing. We can actually go and visit him. We can see where he was awarded the Victoria Cross. And, and sadly, he was uh, killed a few days later on the first day of the Battle of Passchendaele on the uh, the 12th of uh, October. So uh, in, in attempting to do the, a very similar act to the one that had, uh, had, had, had caused him to be awarded the Victoria Cross, so very sad but again I think people who do these acts are aware of the of the difficulty and the of what they're doing but very much they just want to get this over with and they want to try and preserve the lives of their men and as a sergeant that's exactly what he was trying to do and sadly will lose lose his life so he's buried here. Well, let's begin the tour, Pete. As you said, we've come in the back and we're, we're standing at the back of the cemetery. So as we've just come through, what, to just describe what we're now looking at and, and particularly that memorial that you touched on before, the memorial wall behind us. Yeah. So we're looking, first of all, as we walk through and into the cemetery itself, we're looking at the back of the wall. And the back of the wall is, is beautifully uh, napped flint. So it's flint, a stone from England uh, and found on the summer, everywhere on the summer. It's found wherever chalk can be found. And this napped flint is, is pressed into the wall. So we have a, a beautiful uh, back of the wall. The front of it is covered in Jurassic limestone. 
and it's it's only when you step a little bit away and turn around to look back at the the the, the entrance you've just walked through, you realise all of these names. And these are, are the names of the of the missing, nearly thirty five thousand names. That's just, it's just mind boggling. You have to kind of walk further and further back and keep looking at the wall to realise how many people that there are there are on there. So what is that all about? Well, these are the missing from this area because. In the August of 1917, the names move from the Menning Gate, and that's where anybody that uh, died in the area of the salient for the British, um, for Australians, they're all down there. All the Australians are down there, as are all the Canadians. But for the British, there, there are just too many. And it was decided that they would be moved up onto this, this wall at Tynecott Cemetery. And so we have uh, this just this extraordinary number of, of, of missing soldiers, 35,000. Of course... Some of that thirty five thousand are here they are part of the of the uh, eight and a half thousand men who are unknown here so if you go and look at the near uh, uh, a headstone that says uh, 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 the badge of a the Manchester regiment but a, a soldier known to to God, then he is on that wall if you look at the Manchester section and because it 's regimentally by by regiment, look at the Manchester regiment and he he will be on that wall somewhere so it 's nice in that in that way you know the names are close to to the men themselves, but it is just mind boggling the archway that we come through this little area that we come through is a little asp. I think that's a technical term for it, a little asp there. And that's where the New Zealanders are. So the New Zealanders are on this wall as well. I said it's the, the British, but the central section there, the central asp, the, there are New Zealanders uh, commemorated there as well because they are always commemorated close to their battlefield and they fought on the Gravenstaffel Ridge, which is on our right. If we're looking into the cemetery from this back wall, it's on our right-hand side and that's where we get the, the New Zealanders fighting here during the, the Battle uh, of Passchendaele and they are there missing are commemorated here. Now, there's always a name there. I'm just going to talk about it quickly because I, I, it just catches my eye all the time. And there's a padre. There's a, a New Zealand uh, padre uh, chaplain who is commemorating there. And I often think, how on earth does a chaplain become missing in this in this battle? And, of course, it's because he's right up close by the front. He was in one of the blockhouses and he'd actually just stepped outside. He's known as Ca His name is Captain Guy Spencer Brian Brown. And he was administering to the wounded, helping the wounded, giving no, no doubt talking to the wounded, perhaps giving them water, giving them the, the last rites, uh, even, even though he was a, he was actually a Church of England chaplain. Um, but he stepped outside to get some air, and as he stepped outside, a shell landed beside uh, him, and he was killed, and he was buried by the blockhouse. But his body couldn't be found at the end of the at the end of the war. So so he's commemorated to the missing, and I always point him out because it's just unusual to see a a, a chaplain uh, in the list of the missing. It's quite remarkable, Pete, the, the nature of Tynecott. I mean, I, I've said this so many times, so actually my apologies to everyone who's heard this, but I talk about this all the time. The scale of death in the First World War is something we can't get our head around. The combination of this wall with 35,000 names and noting there's another 54,000 on the Menon Gate and then 12,000 headstones, which is more than the human mind can comprehend when you take them all in. It's just that there's no other place on the battlefields where you can just at least get a sense of what a big battle meant and a big series of battles meant and the sacrifice and the loss and the devastated families. It's just overwhelming, isn't it? Well, it, it's it's also very, very clever because the landscape that we can see, because we are on the slopes of a ridge in a very flat landscape, this is the slope that will take us up onto the top of the Passchendaele Ridge. And and from here, you get a great view. We can see the spires of Ypres. We can see all the way. And you realise that the landscape, that landscape of hell, of desolation, is from where we are standing all the way to perhaps where we came from in the morning or where we're going to be heading to in the afternoon uh, to Ypres itself. So it's it's just extraordinary to have that, 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 that vista of the landscape, to be able to see it. Uh, and you you start to really understand about why these guys are in here, why so many people are in here, because they're going to be killed in that landscape that was a, a landscape that was was nothing but other than hell that is that is all around us. So it's it's an extraordinary place to be, and and because of those preserved blockhouses, we get that extra feel, you know, that extra feeling of well, we, here we are, we are actually standing on the battlefield. So leaving the wall, Pete, and walking further into the cemetery, what's our what's our next destination? Well, the interesting part here is in the old days, as we walked, as we left the wall and started walking, we started to walk in a quagmire. Because in the period when more and more people were uh, were arriving here, these it's lawn. You immediately stepped onto lawn, and that was what was envisaged by the architects that you know there would be a connection with the land here by walking on on the lawns. 
but it was starting to get silly. So they've, they, they've in the last uh, five years, perhaps even six years now, they've paved them. So we're walking on a Jurassic limestone pavement. And that's fantastic because we now don't have to squelch slightly. And it means that the lawns can stay in their normal pristine condition. So we're onto this Jurassic limestone uh, pavers, which will take us up to the Stone of Remembrance. This this uh, altar, I suppose, it was designed to to, to look like an altar. Um, and we can we can stand in front of this altar and we're looking directly then from the altar to the cross of sacrifice and in between that altar and the cross of sacrifice uh, is the stone of remembrance the cross of sacrifice that is where we we have the little original battlefield cemetery so this this small grouping of of men that were buried here uh, around the blockhouse when the blockhouse was, was purely a blockhouse so that again we get these various aspects this great concentration cemetery in all directions then this small battlefield cemetery cross of sacrifice the blockhouses the wall behind us with all the names of the missing so there's so much to talk about and you, you can literally i always get lost in here you can stay in here for two hours and and still not finish talking and that's without actually walking in the mosques the graves and perhaps pointing out a soldier here and a soldier there there is just so much to talk about in amongst all of, all, all of this all of these all of the graves and the walls and the blockhouses and the and the and the views that we get i always find it a fascinating place that original little part of the cemetery you can spot it instantly because all the graves are laid out in such a higgledy piggledy nature compared to the nice neat straight rows of the concentration cemetery so it's instantly identifiable that this was a cemetery built during the war because they just the the, the hurried nature the, the the rushed nature of burying these soldiers just wherever there was a convenient spot and it tells such an interesting little story. There's a number of, of, of graves that are together, com, you know, communal graves where a number of bodies have been put in the graves together. So the, the headstones are marked with co-joined badges of various units. Um, there's, there's a couple of graves that say just four unknown soldiers of the Great War or six unknown soldiers. So showing that a whole bunch of unknown men were thrown in there together and just marked. A couple of Germans in there, a couple of unknown Germans, but a couple of Germans who were killed on the 4th of October, 1917. So you would assume defenders of this pillbox who when the Australians came through cleared the area they just simply chucked these these dead Germans they just killed into into the nearest shell hole and, and, and carried on so the even the little cemetery itself around the around the, the cross of sacrifice tells some just fascinating little stories yeah it, 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 it does and then of course if you want that extra view then you can actually and, and this is seen by some people as not a good thing to do but it was designed to do this i always explain to people that you know you can walk up steps onto the cross of sacrifice and you can sit there on the cro cross of sacrifice and look down on the graves or look across the landscape and contemplate now we do get people nowadays who who don't like it. They seem to think that people are climbing and it's 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 sacrilegious. They shouldn't be climbing on the cross of sacrifice. But it was designed to do that. Now it wasn't designed for kids to run round and round it, which occasionally you do see as well. But um, but it was designed for you to go up there to sit on the on the uh, on on the stone there. It's it's literally designed to be a seat and to look at the battlefield. And and yet we do get some people who don't like it nowadays. What do you think about it, Matt? Do you do you, do you like it? It's a great question. We've touched on this before and I've touched on it in other podcasts when I did a walk around Passchendaele for living history. I, I talked about it as well. I, I, th I think we can be a bit too precious about these things. It's wonderful the amount of respect people show to these cemeteries and to these hallowed sites. And they absolutely should. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful. But we don't want to get too precious about it. We don't want to start undoing the good work that the designers and the veterans and the pilgrims intended for the cemeteries. And that's a perfect example. When they built this, they built it so that people could climb up on the on the cross of sacrifice and for that reason that they could look out across this entire cemetery and indeed the entire battlefield and it would give people a perspective of how much ground was was fought over of of the sacrifice that the men who are lying here made to 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 capture this ground so it's a it's an absolutely original intention of the cemetery and i don't think there's anything wrong with us fulfilling the ambitions of the cemetery designers to do that and thousands and thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of Family members of missing soldiers, hundreds of thousands of veterans have made that same climb. And I, I don't feel that we're not worthy to follow in their footsteps. I feel we're continuing the journey that they began, as long as you're doing it respectfully. It's the same thing as we said. You've, you've mentioned this before, Pete, that the idea of maybe having a cup of coffee and a sandwich in a cemetery, people would look at that and go, oh, that's outrageous. You can't eat within a cemetery. But again, that's why these cemeteries were designed. Many of them have little benches and little, not quite picnic areas, but little little poor weather areas where you could sit to keep out of the rain and have a have a flask of coffee and a sandwich again because 
pilgrims were coming to spend, and they would spend time here. If a family came and found their their son buried in a cemetery, they weren't just going to go to you know tap the grave and wander off after a few minutes. They were going to stay for hours, and so they needed places to get out of the rain. They needed somewhere they could sit and have a sandwich and a you know rejuvenating cup of coffee. And these features are still built into these cemeteries. And I, I'm of the beliefs. I, I know that some people think, well, we're not worthy. We didn't fight there. We didn't lose a son. We're not worthy of of participating in the same way that those people did. I disagree. We are doing a, a wonderful thing by making a pilgrimage of our own to the battlefields to pay our respects. And I think we should use the cemeteries originally as they were intended. I did it only last week. Uh, I went to a, a little cemetery called uh, Sunken Road Cemetery, um, quite close to Poissier. And uh, it was just starting to rain. We had a flask of coffee with us. And I remembered that in this cemetery, there is a little shelter. Literally, it's a very narrow shelter. It's tucked in. It's got a bench at the end of it. And we we we, caught, we, we dived into there. The wind was howling. The rain came pouring down. We got the flask out and we uh, had a biscuit each. And, and we sat there and drank a coffee and waited for it to, to blow over. And that's exactly what they were designed for. Uh, so uh, absolutely nothing wrong in having a coffee and a biscuit or a sandwich uh, in these in these little little shelters. I have to say, perhaps Tynecott, because it is so so open, uh, not not ideal. Uh, and even by the design, it kind of gives you a clue. Really, you know, this is more of a, of yes, you could have a flask of coffee, but it 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 doesn't feel a place where you could stand. There's no little shelters. It, it's very much a place where you contemplate. Now, I was going to bring something in here. Of course, there was somebody else that climbed on top of this blockhouse before the cross of sacrifice was put on top of it, and that was the king. Uh, The king in 1922 uh, came on a pilgrimage to the Western Front, and this was a place he really wanted to go to. Now, you have to say it's interesting, because nearly everywhere else he went to, the cemeteries were complete. Uh, They had their headstones in, the new headstones, not the crosses, not the wooden crosses any longer. We see see headstones now, but that isn't what they, they were built originally with. They had crosses. When he came to Tynecott, it was still crosses everywhere, but it was, he still wanted to come, even though it wasn't completed, by no means completed. The cross of sacrifice wasn't on top of the pillbox. I mean, there is a story that it, w- it was the king himself that, that suggested that the cross of sacrifice should be built on top of the pillbox. It's definitely not the case, because the layout was done, the design was finished. You know, that is how it was going to look. The cross of sacrifice was definitely already going to go on top of the... Uh, the pillbox, but there we see we can see the the photo of the king standing on top of the the pillbox, looking out onto the the graves all around him. But they are still wooden, wooden crosses, and uh, I like that imagery that the king made the effort. He he was very keen, and in fact, the book he produced, which I have a copy of on my, my bookshelf here, the King's Pilgrimage, nineteen twenty two, was uh, was going to be used the sale of that book to help pilgrims to come to these battlefields. So it's uh, he wanted the, the families to be able to get here and he knew that a lot of them would need help. So the sale of this book helped them to come here to come and see the graves for themselves. You say that word pilgrimage, Pete, and it's, it's a chapter that I think is a fascinating story. If you're someone that's interested in the First World War, do more than just study the battles. Learn about the pilgrims that came over because there's some absolutely fascinating aspects. And I find it an incredible aspect to think of those British families in the main coming over to visit their lost sons and how they must have felt when they walked along those rows. You know, we, we feel it today when we're going, oh, we want to look up the, the name of someone from our local town or someone who won a Victoria Cross, so we'll walk the rows. Oh, here he is over here. Imagine you were doing that, but it was for your son. Imagine seeing your family name and the name of your son on that headstone, and it just must have been shattering, just heartbreaking for those families. And the story of those pilgrims and the pilgrimages is just fascinating. And if you you can get now copies of the the old Michelin guides, the old Michelin guides to the battlefields, which talk about how to basically explore the battlefields in an old Model T Ford or the equivalent in the early 1920s. They're fascinating to read, whether it says, you know, to get to Messine from Ypres, you'll have to walk most of the way because the road is still shell blasted even five or six years after the war. And it's just a really fascinating chapter. And the, the fact that the king would do something as unregal as scramble up to the top of the pillbox to look out over the views. It's just, we've got these wonderful connections with history. I love the stories of the pilgrims in the post-war years. Yeah, I think it's, I think what's amazing, it, uh, those books you you just mentioned on, the, the guidebooks to the Western Front, and there was a, a multitude of them produced, all came out in the very early 1920s. So you have to think, well, if these are coming out in the 1920s, when were they writing them? Well, literally, as the Germans were forced back in the in that final phase of the of the war, the hundred days, which will take the Germans out of the war and cause the armistice to be signed, then there were literally roving reporters 
following up behind as soon as they could get on the battlefield, writing down what they thought was going to be a good thing to come and have a look at. Because these, these little books came out very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, because it was, they knew, they could feel it. You have to say, so there was, there must have already been discussions that people were going to go, I suppose it was obvious with the number of dead and, and, uh, and the, the fact that people could then travel again. And Britain is so close to where the battlefields were compared to Australia or Canada or America or, where, or, or New Zealand. And you know, they knew that especially people from Britain were going to want to come and look, even those that hadn't lost people. You know, they would want to come and look. And of course, we now know that a lot of the servicemen themselves, as they were discharged, came immediately back. And we know why PTSD, as we, we now call it, they needed to come back to the battlefields themselves. So in the 1920s, we have relatives, uh, we have people that are just interested, and we have the veterans themselves all intermingling and, on, on, the, on these battlefields. You mentioned the people from far-flung countries, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, America. You know, if we talk about the dominions of the British Empire and how far they had to travel, just bear that in mind. You know, if, you, if, if, if you're one of those people who questions whether you're worthy of making this trip to walk the battlefields, whether you're worthy to stand in the, in the, the shadows of these graves, bear that in mind that the families who lost someone from Australia or New Zealand or Canada or South Africa or so many other places from around the world, they never would have made this trip in the main. Not only was it too expensive, but if you think about it, the only way to get there was by ship. It was probably six weeks each way on a ship. So you would have had to take a few months off work to come to the battlefields. Who, if you're a working a working man or woman in the suburban suburbs of you know Sydney or Perth or Melbourne, who would have had the time or the money to take a three-month trip to Europe in the early 1920s? So most of the families never got to see these graves in their lifetime. So when you come and you stand in front of the, the grave of a soldier, if you've come all the way from Australia or New Zealand or Canada or South Africa, you're completing this pilgrimage the family never did. And so you absolutely are worthy to stand in these spots. And it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, you know, a wonderful thing you're doing. And, and, and you deserve, uh, you know, a big, uh, a big thank you for, for making that effort because you are making that connection with history that the families never got to themselves. So I don't want to get too philosophical about it, but I always feel that when you take Australians to these graves, when you take New Zealanders, that they are paying an immense respect to these men who, who unfortunately their families never got the opportunity to do that. It's always fascinating when I'm on a, a tour coach to actually to get a breakdown of, of why the people are here. And there are always people who are directly relatives of soldiers that were lost here. And in very many cases, they are the first relatives to visit. Then there are people who uh, who have relatives who fought but didn't die. And then there are people who have no connection. There may be recent arrivals from other countries uh, to Australia or Canada uh, and no real connection to the Great War. And they are here because they want to learn about it and understand. And so you get this mix of uh, of people and, and why they come to the battlefields. And, and it doesn't really matter. It, and I think that's the most important thing, so long as we come. I mean, for all these guys that are lying in these uh, this enormous cemetery, you know, the, the worst aspect would be if nobody came. If the gates were just closed and nobody bothered to come, that would be the worst outcome, uh, I think, uh, of the of the creation of these cemeteries, because they are beautiful. And we haven't mentioned the, uh, what we're looking at as well. In the summer, when you come here, the number of roses here, it's just extraordinary. It is a beautiful, beautiful place. And it was intended to be. Now, these were supposed to look like English gardens. And I use that to English because that is what, what they wanted and I have in the past said why isn't it like an Australian garden well an Australian garden wouldn't grow particularly well in northern France but an English garden will and so that's what the plan was that these places would be beautiful and would feel beautiful and because Tancos is so big and it has areas that uh, denote where so you can find a, a soldier obviously there is a map there is a plan and to aid you with that we have wider gaps within the graves and they've used those wider gaps to plant larger plants which is unusual you don't see large plants in the cemeteries very often it makes it even more beautiful it is a beautiful place to come to well let's enjoy the beauty even more pete where are we heading to next after we've left the cross of sacrifice and the blockhouse well, we're going to carry on walking down the central path. There's a, a footpath right up through the middle. Now, again, we get wear sometimes here, but they've done something very clever. They use a plastic mesh that actually uh, stops the soil from being compressed so badly because they get so many thousands and thousands of, of people uh, weekly, that uh, or daily in some cases, that it means uh, the ground compresses and the grass dies. So we get this. It's not very noticeable, but it helps. We're going to walk down through the, the, the centre towards what what would be the entrance, the old entrance, 
Um, and uh, we're going to go and have a, a look at uh, two graves that I always take people to. Um, and these are two uh, soldiers that were awarded the Victoria Cross. There are actually three soldiers buried within the cemetery who were awarded the Victoria Cross. But I have to say, predominantly, I, I tend to take uh, can, um, Australians. Uh, we have one Canadian and two Australians buried here. We've already mentioned one of them, Sergeant Lewis McGee of the 40th Battalion. He's very relevant to here because, of course, this is where he fought. We can see the... Uh, we can't quite see the blockhouse. It's in a little farm complex below us to the right-hand side. Interestingly, it's a place I've always wanted to go to, but it's got one of the world's grumpiest farmers who owns it. And every time you try to go and sneak in to go and have a look at the blockhouse that McGee actually took then you get shooed off in a rather un, a rather unceremonious I'm, I'm exactly the same pete it's exactly the same for me it's the one spot on the battlefields i've never managed to get to is <laughs> hamburg farm so one day one day we will uh we should buy him a gift or something but we will crack that one day and get a look at, uh, at lewis mcgee's pillbox yeah because it is there and, and it's an interesting comment isn't it why on earth would you build a farm complex around the pillbox well, it's actually the other way around. The pillbox was built in the middle of a, f a farm complex to camouflage it. The farm is then blown away in the fighting. The farmer comes back in the 1920s. And you can imagine coming back and saying, well, that's where my farm was. Yes, it's gone. I expected that. But what am I to do with this damn great blockhouse that's here? And so they built the farms around the blockhouses. So when you look at this landscape, it's not obvious how many blockhouses still survive. A lot of them are within farm complexes. They use them for keeping things in. Uh, they use them for growing uh, mushrooms in or whatever, but they're, they're there. And uh, we know for, for a fact that the McGee's blockhouse is still there within that complex. But yeah, one day, one day we'll get there. McGee was actually killed in the field. Uh, again, to, if you're standing facing the front of the cemetery, he was killed in the field to the right, an area known as Augustus Wood, although there was no wood there at all. Uh, just that terrible slog towards the village of Passchendaele, just... The, the fields all around Tynecott are absolute killing fields from the Battle of Passchendaele and that field. So again, if you're standing in the cemetery facing the entrance, the field immediately to your right uh, was where the, the side of Augustus Wood and that was where the Australians got so bogged down during that advance towards Passchendaele. They didn't get much further than that field on the right and uh, sadly there, Lewis McGee was killed along with hundreds and hundreds of his uh, of his comrades who now, most of whom are now buried in Tynecott Cemetery. Yeah. And then if we go further to the left towards the blockhouse that's on the left-hand side, then we come across a grave again, which is is interesting because it ties in nicely with what we've just been talking about. And that is a visit to the uh, to, to uh, look for your relative or to go and see the grave of your relative. And this is the grave of Captain Clarence Smith Jeffrey, Jeffreys, should I say, uh, of the 34th Battalion. And he was uh, uh, mortally wounded and died uh, during the attack uh, on the uh, the twelfth, I think. Um, and he actually died uh, on on that day and was awarded the Victoria Cross for the fighting on that day. Um, his his uh, mortal wound was well reported. It's rather gruesome. He was shot in the stomach and it took him some time to die. He was then uh, buried by another battalion and, and his grave was marked, but it was lost. Like so many, uh, it was lost. Um, Interestingly, both of these men, both of the guys we're talking about, would not would be unaware that they were going to be awarded the Victoria Cross. They both died, one posthumously, one a few days after. So neither of them would be aware that they would eventually be awarded the Victoria Cross. Clarence uh, Smith uh, Jeffries uh, was, was lost, and he was not actually found until uh, 1921. And his father had actually made that long journey from Australia. They were from Newcastle. They were a wealthy family, obviously. And his father had made that journey. He'd come to the to the Western Front to help look for his son. He uh, uh, he was affected to such a degree. He felt it was the only thing he could do. And he, a very lucky situation. He was wealthy enough to be able to come. Um, and he was there uh, looking and, and the body was not found. Now, I have heard it said that he was on the way back to Australia when the body was found. I've just been looking at the dates and times. It doesn't work. I, I, I suspect that he was already back in Australia when his body was found. And so he had to come again. He, he, he felt it was necessary. Necessary, and he made the pilgrimage again to actually to visit his uh, his son's grave. One of the things I should say: we are getting more information from the Commonwealth War Graves all the time. And one of the things that were that they are they are allowing us. They've always had these things in the records. They, they didn't feel it was uh, the right thing to do to uh, to open the, up these records until perhaps most of the uh, of the the people themselves, the survivors, have now gone. There's nobody left from the Great War, and so we have information concerning how they were identified, what they were was was found on their bodies, where they were exhumed from originally, and we know that he was identified by his captain's pips. 
some uh, Australian numerals on his uniform and his initials on the ground sheet. And that's why uh, how he was identified uh, in, the ni- in 1921 when his body was found. Just about every time I've been to Tynecott and, and eavesdropped on a group there, you'll hear someone say that Jeffries was killed capturing the pillbox that he's now buried in front of. Uh, that's not the case. He was uh, he was killed a, a little bit further uh, over at a place called Decline Cops, which is over on the railway line uh, to your left as you stand uh, looking at towards the front of the cemetery. Um, and it's a fascinating story. He led charges on several pillboxes and captured them and killed the crews. And then he uh, charged a final German position and the, the German swung the machine gun around and killed him, but his men completed the capture. Uh, also, just incidentally, if you are in Sydney... We've mentioned before the wonderful museum put together by Brad Manera at the uh, at the Hyde Park Memorial, at the Anzac Memorial in Hyde Park in the middle of Sydney. Uh, if you go in there, there's a wonderful. Uh, it's not a diorama, but it's a fe- it's a similar thing. It's a model showing the attack uh, Je- of Jeffries uh, on these pillboxes uh, on the Passchendaele Ridge, and so that's what's depicted in this wonderful model uh, in the as the centerpiece of this museum at the at the Anzac Memorial in Hyde Park. So so definitely go and check that out if you're. In Sydney, it's an amazing story. Clarence Jeffries is an amazing story, and he was he was from he went to Dudley, I think Dudley High School, and he and another of his classmates were awarded the Victoria Cross during the First World War, which is astonishing. Two blokes from the same class, uh, from a corner, tiny little corner of Newcastle. So a, a great story, uh, Clarence Jeffries. And interesting, his name. People think his last name was Smith Jeffries, as if it was hyphenated. It wasn't. It was the Smith is his middle name. The common. It's um, a good middle common, name. It's a good it's a, middle name. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's interesting, Pete. It's kind of fallen out of favour a little bit. This idea that's but it's particularly prominent during the First World War because you see it on so many headstones. But the idea that the oldest son would take his mother's maiden name as his middle name. So that's why you often see some quite unusual middle names. Like Smith is an unusual middle name. Uh, you, you'll see Mackenzie and McDonald and Fraser, and you see all of these unusual. But that was the common practice, which has fallen out of favour. Of the, the oldest son would have his mother's maiden name, which is actually a really nice family connection. That uh, I, you know I think we should bring back in. But let's talk about the pillboxes. We're standing now right in front of these pillboxes. Let's talk about them. I'm just going to go back just slightly, as I often Please do. do. Uh, just talking about that uh, diorama that you were talking about uh, uh, that uh, was created uh, with, with the help of Brad Manera. Um, I actually was involved in that because, bizarre as it may seem, they wanted to get the colour right of the colour of the mud. And so I was asked to go and look at some some Flanders mud and to try and try and identify the colour and then send a kind of a swatch back so that they could ensure that the mud was painted in the right shade of the uh, of, uh, to, uh, to for, for to, uh, to make it a realistic depiction of the of the landscape. So if you go and have a look at it, then then that colour was was chosen by myself. <laughs> Pete, it never ceases to amaze me the uh, the extent that you are involved in the in, in remembrance, particularly for Australians. It's a wonderful gift. I mean. You, your partner is Australian, your children are half Australian. It's a wonderful gift that you give to Australia, your involvement in this. So thank you for that on behalf of all Australians. So when you go and, when you go and observe the mud and you note if you've been to Tynecott, you go, geez, they did well with the uh, colour of that mud. <laughs> yeah, great, it's great. Or how, we, mud, we'd probably pronounce it, mud, isn't it? we would. Mud, mud, yeah, the colour uh, of the mud. Uh, you can thank Pete Smith. But um, let's talk about, in, in this, it's actually a good segue to talk about the mud and the trenches and the pillboxes. I mean, the mud was the reason that there are so many pillboxes in this part of the battlefield. Let's talk about them. Well, when you look at this pillbox that's directly in front of us now, it, it always seems odd because you think, how did they get into it to start off with? There's, there's no door. There should be a door at the back, and we are at the back of it. There's nothing obviously there. But if you look carefully, you can see the, the top of some uh, concrete slabs, and those slabs are covering over the doorway. So what that tells you immediately is that the doorway is low down, um, and so we entered by a very shallow trench. The entrance to these pillbox is normally a kneeler door. So this is not full-size doors. You got in, into them with a smaller entrance as you could easily get into without actually crawling, really crawling. Um, and that's because the larger the, the aperture, the larger the opening, then the more chance of a piece of steel getting inside there. So you wanted a small opening. Um, there's actually two. So there's two openings, which also tells you why would you have two openings? Well, it's because it's in two sections. This pillbox is has a wall in the a middle section. So it's actually two con- separate compartments. And again, for that reason, that if a, a fragment of steel or a shell got inside it and it detonated, because it's in two sections, it means that not everybody would be killed, just the one side that was destroyed. So so it's one blockhouse, but uh, two segments in, inside. If you then walk round to the front, because the back is fairly, it looks okay. It's The concrete's fairly flush. And the, I should say, we have talked about concrete 
previously in the, in these podcasts. This is good quality concrete. Gives you a- we both get we both get pretty excited when we talk oh, about we concrete do. in pillboxes. I know yeah. the good. nerd comes out in us. <laughs> good quality concrete it means it was made behind the lines far enough that they could bring up commercial uh, mixers for mixing this. So very well made concrete. Um, we walk round to the front, and which was facing the enemy, and in this case Australians, and it's pockmarked all over. So you, we, we can immediately see again uh, what side was taking the damage. There are also fire apertures here. So this is not just a, a, as, as some of the earlier pillboxes would be, and very common to find just shelters. So they are just shelters. This was not a shelter. If you wanted to, you could fight from within it. Now, I have to say, in most cases, the Germans did not. They brought their guns out as we got closer and closer, we being the Australians in this in this case, and they set their guns up beside the pillboxes. They very rarely fought from within them. They didn't like it, and I can understand why completely. You like that bit more of a freedom behind your sandbag walls because, of course, the shelling stops when the infantry gets close. So you're not going to be so heavily shelled and it means that you have more chance of catching your enemy with the guns when you can swing it round quickly. So, but we do have fire apertures at the front here, fairly fixed. They didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of sway, and we can see by the angle that it was very long range. This would have been firing almost at the maximum. So these these guns were originally used for long range firing. When the infantry got closer, you took your gun outside and you fought outside. Um, very often, the people that went inside then would be command or medical that would uh, would take over the inside of the blockhouse, um, and so these were, were heavily fought over. But they are they're great examples. I think it's a shame we can't actually go inside them, but I can see why we can't because here it's so uh, waterlogged. Almost certainly they're full of, or half full of water. The lower the lower areas, so it wouldn't be suitable. Um, but it's a shame because there are there are an awful lot of them about, but very few that we can actually get uh, get inside. We should mention as well, these were named by British and Australian troops in the area. One is called the, the two pillboxes at the front of the cemetery. One is called Irksome and the other is called The Barnacle, which describes, I think, pretty specifically how difficult they were to capture. Um, just really good examples, again, of these these frontline positions, you know, fighting in the mud. The fighting here was not very solid fixed trenches, as we would have seen on the Somme. The fighting here was the Germans were employing what was called defence in depth, where pillboxes would be mutually supporting and I, Pete, I read a statistic. I, I, this may be wrong, but the statistic I read was that the Australians captured the the first two pillboxes at the front of the cemetery early on in the attack. But it took them several days to take the other pillboxes, which now occupy the cemetery as well, because there's two more at the back of the cemetery too that are covered up. But that it actually took them several days to complete the capture of the area, which is now known as Time Got Cemetery. But I'm just trying to imagine being in occupying the area around one of those pillboxes at the front and literally only 100 metres away, the area is still occupied by German machine gun crews. It just, just, it's, it's not surprising that so many people were killed. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's interesting, isn't it? It's, uh, I find it quite horrific, actually. Uh, pillbox fighting, I, I would much rather be outside than, than inside. But the, the, that's a choice you have. When the enemy gets closer, you can fight from the outside uh, or you can fight from the inside. And of course, if you've made that decision to fight from the inside and you've shut the steel doors and you've barricaded them and you've just got apertures and you've got machine guns poking out of these, they are flipping difficult to take because you've got to get right up to them and somehow you've got to get a grenade or something inside. And if you've got a garrison that is uh, mutually supportive, so you've got another pillbox covering the front of that one and it can fire across the front and they can protect each other, it's difficult to get close to them to actually get into them. So, again, it's down to the quality of the men in a lot of cases. If they're willing to fight it out and hope that somebody else will come and come and relieve them and, and help them or the enemy will fall back, then they're, they are willing to fight on. Um, it's always a choice you have, fight on or, or surrender or die, really. And uh, yeah, and we get a, a great range of, of things happening. Sometimes the bunkers fell very, very easily, very quickly. Other times they've, they fought it on and on and, uh, until eventually they're all killed. Or, or in fact, we fail to take it and we have to fall back. We've talked about a lot of things in this podcast series, Pete, relating to the horrors of the First World War. And, uh, I, and, and all of them are horrific. The, the nature of everything that we describe is just horrific. But... I don't think anything is more horrific than the idea of being a machine gun crew inside a concrete pillbox as you are surrounded by the enemy, especially after you've just killed dozens of their comrades. They are not going to treat you well. And the, the horrific nature of, of the pillbox fighting in general for both sides, but very, very few prisoners were ever taken from those pillboxes. The, there was something seen as incredibly unsporting uh, 
to machine gun dozens of men from the safety of concrete and then as soon as you realise the game was up to throw your arms up in the air and, and try to be taken prisoner. The, 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 the Very few of these German machine gun crews were taken prisoner. Just absolutely horrific. Yeah, I mean, we get some uh, horrific accounts and perhaps the one that uh, we've we've spoken about in a previous podcast uh, when we did uh, Polygon Wood, but the fighting at uh, Scott's Post at the uh, the blockhouse there was particularly horrific. Where to next, Pete, after we've examined the pillboxes? I mean, they're, they're both very impressive. They've got tall trees around them. You can see them from miles around. They're, you can see they're right on the top of the ridge. It gives, you, it gives you an astonishing perspective. You don't feel like you're on top of a ridge when you stand at Tynecott until you look out on the view and see how the ground slopes down. And they're very, very well placed, these pillboxes, to just cover the, the, the entire ridge top. And I think that's the key to the cemetery. The cemetery equally was very well placed. And you you often wonder what was the architect uh, looking for. It's uh, Sir Herbert Baker, who is the uh, the architect here, or the main architect. And and he was looking for symmetry to start off with. And that symmetry he found in the, uh, in the pillboxes, in these three that we can now see or know where they are. As you mentioned, there are others, but we can no longer see them. They are buried beneath uh, some of the, the buildings uh, here, especially at the back. Um, so it's uh, we're going to walk towards the entrance, what would be the entrance, um, and just have a chat about something that we haven't mentioned before. How on earth do you find somebody in this cemetery? If you are looking for somebody, how do you find them? Well, they have registers. They have a register of everybody that's buried in this cemetery. Um, and so from that register and from, and it's alphabetical for everybody that's buried here, whichever nationality within the Commonwealth you, Commonwealth you are, there's also a, a map, a plan. Uh, so we, we can actually find them, a reference with each each name, and we can actually find them. It, it's not easy. It's such a big cemetery that it, I always have to have a, if I know that I have relatives or people that are interested in the grave, I always have to have a pre-look because it's, uh, it's difficult to, uh, um, not easy because it's such a large cemetery to find them immediately. Um, it's good practice, actually. To have a go, have a go at finding uh, the 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 soldiers uh, at the uh, um, buried within a cemetery. Uh, start with a smaller one. It's easier with a smaller one. It's not so so confronting because it is confronting, and that's a, that's the thing that's interesting here because this is the old entrance. This is the way that if you want to, you can walk down the side. Something we haven't mentioned. We've I think we've mentioned it in previous podcasts, but the, the, there is a visitor centre here, um, and it isn't. One of my favourites. There are others, and, and I think it's. I'm not sure it's necessary. You know, we, we have museums all over. We can go. Do we need a visitor centre for a for a cemetery? Perhaps, perhaps for those that know nothing, then it, it is helpful. But I think for a lot of people who have done a little bit of reading, and there's an awful lot written about Tyne Cot Cemetery, it's not necessary to uh, to loiter long in the uh, in the visitor centre here. But if you come via the visitor centre, then it brings you down the side of the wall, and you come through the traditional entrance at the at the front here, and that's where we're standing now, looking at the register and looking back up towards the blockhouse, and it gives us an, another perspective. It's a perspective looking at the cemetery above us or, or on the sloping ground in front of us. It's just an extraordinary place, Pete. I mean, that, that interpretive centre that's there, I suppose it's it's a good thing. I, It was one of the ones that I probably saw as an example of potentially, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but is it necessary to have an interpretive centre there? But the, the, the centrepiece, which I thought was a little bit ironic, is that they have a display case showing, well, I think it's beneath the floor, but showing artefacts from the First World War that were discovered, but they were discovered during the construction of the interpretive centre, so there's kind of a there's kind of a, a circular loop there of, of thoughts about uh, why they're on display. But it, it's it's and and they have a, a a commentary. They show pictures. They project pictures on the walls of soldiers buried in the cemetery, and they have their names and ages. So it's, it it can be quite moving to look at that interpretive centre. But one of the things about interpretive centres, and we mentioned this a few weeks ago, and we talked about it, that I have a slight issue with is it changes the it can potentially change the way the cemetery is used from the original design. And probably the best example of that is uh, Lysenhoek Cemetery, again, also in the Ypres Salient, the second largest Commonwealth War Cemetery in the world. And it was the largest at the end of the First World War because it was constructed during the war. An incredible cemetery. And unusually, when you approach Lysenhoek, the entrance is sort of in the bottom left corner. It's not in the center like it is at Tynecott. And when you go to that cemetery, it, it always seems very weird that you have to walk all the way along the front. And obviously in the old days, you used to just park on the road out the front, but the entrance is sort of in the bottom left corner. And I believe that was because Lysenhoek Cemetery, because it was a hospital cemetery and created during the war, the headstones are very close together compared to Tynecott. And when you come through that door, I believe the original intention was to force you to look diagonally across the cemetery and just to get this incredible perspective Tynecott is so well laid out that you don't you don't quite get that perspective of just how many headstones you're looking at. But when you go to Lysenhoek, because they're so crammed together, 
you have this incredible perspective when you come through the front entrance of just looking diagonally across the cemetery at all these thousands and thousands. I think it's close to 10,000 headstones. They built an interpretive centre several years ago at Lysenhoek at the side, and they built a car park. And so what they did was they put a little gate in at the side as well so you could come straight from the interpretive centre into the cemetery. And to me, that changed the entire perspective. And to me, you lost that effect that the original architects had. Interestingly, last time I was there, that gate was closed and locked and they were encouraging you to walk back around the front. So maybe they uh, maybe they realise the error of their ways. But it is one of the things that I have an, a slight issue with when we do these these new things is it does change the the way these cemeteries and memorials were originally intended to be to be used. I'm not going to say anything. Now, the reason I'm not going to say anything is because I'd like to do a podcast on on, uh, on Listen Hook uh, at some stage in the in the future. Uh, and there's a there's a very good reason why we walk around the front now, but I, w- I won't spoil it because I think it's a it's a good story to tell, and, and there's a whole story we can do on on that uh, on that cemetery. But it's it is it's a fascinating cemetery, and it is interesting that we have to walk so far the same as Tancock to a certain extent to get in the original entrance um, because there is no parking anywhere near the original entrance. That was a wonderful little tangent from me. It's it's wonderful. It's like a journey on the battlefield. You could wander <laughs> off in all sorts of directions <laughs> during this podcast. Yeah. Um, back to Tynecott. What else? Uh, we, we've mostly completed the tour now. What else? Uh, is there anything else you wanted to point out? No, I think I think we're there. Um, I was going to mention the architect that uh, designed some of the the sculptures there, F. V. Blundstone. Uh, so he was the uh, the sculptor, um, because there are it's the sculptures. You have to look careful, but on top of the what would you call those buildings? The the buildings at each side uh, of the the la- the wall, the wall memorial to the missing, the big wall at the back. We have angels on the top, and you can miss them. You can just look at them and think, oh, that's a sculpture. But you need to kind of have, like all of these cemeteries, they were very carefully thought through, and we do have to. You do have to look carefully, and that's why it's it's a it's a good thing to spend some time. Not be like some of the the the, the people that visit, you know, off the coach, ram the cemetery, cross the sacrifice, up to the top, take your picture, back on the coach. You need to contemplate and to think and to look because there is so much to look at. And as I said, two hours here can go past in a flash when you're uh, you're wandering amongst these graves. When we were talking about this just before we started recording, Pete, you also mentioned a wonderful little tidbit of information that neither of us knew about the inauguration of the cemetery. Tell us that one, because what a wonderful little point to end on. It is. I just presumed, and I have done for years, that the cemetery, because the king was here um, in his pilgrimage, that uh, perhaps that was the inauguration of, of the cemetery. But in just quickly scribbling some notes down and uh, looking a little bit online, I discovered that the cemetery was actually officially inaugurated on the 20th of June in 1927 by Sir Gilbert Diet. I think that's how you pronounce his name, who is an Australian. Um, and he was the Dominion President of the British Empire Services League from 1921 to 1946. He'd also been uh, the President of the RSL, the Returned uh, uh, Soldiers and uh, Sailors and Airmen, eventually uh, Imperial League in Australia as well. And um, so that's why he obviously got the job of uh, of inaugurating the cemetery in 1927. So I, I was quite pleased to find that. I now need to find out what he did in the First World War. I haven't looked yet. That's going to be a little job in the next uh, few days to see. I know he served on the Gallipoli Peninsula, but what did he do after that? And what rank was he? I have no idea what rank he was. So I'm sure somebody will know all about him. A good little uh, detective uh, hunt for you there, Pete. Again, just the wonderful little uh, tidbits of information you can find while walking the battlefields. And isn't it remarkable that we've spent over an hour talking about one cemetery this just shows people people who haven't had the the privilege of walking the ground of the western front or indeed any famous battlefield perhaps don't quite understand just how much information these sites convey what a strong connection with the history there is and i think this demonstrates that we've spent we've spent more time talking about it than many people will actually spend in the cemetery when they're there it's it's just a remarkable remarkable place and i love these little journeys we do to a specific site pete it's always great to get out and and do a walk where we're walking across the battlefields but the, but Doing a deep dive on some of these iconic sites are just remarkable. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of them. Mate, as always, it's been extraordinary. I've learned so much that I didn't know an hour ago about this this wonderful place. So so thank you very much for, for joining us to talk about it. And I reiterate to people, try and go early in the morning or late in the evening as the sun's rising or setting. It's uh, fantastic. Well said, Pete, and we'll see everyone next week. As always, if you're enjoying the podcast, please go and give us a review, particularly on Apple Podcasts. That's what works best for uh, for helping people to find to find what we're doing here. But uh, it's it's wonderful to have you walking the battlefields with us. And Pete, it's always wonderful to talk to you about it. Pleasure. It's been uh, it's been great. Mm-hmm.